Hello, everyone, and welcome to, Nash to the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these NOAA-wide seminars is to showcase examples of the environmental leadership role that NOAA plays in our society by those who lead it and make it happen. I'd like to take a moment to make a few acknowledgements and the webinar details. First, I would like to thank the NOAA Science Council and the awesome team I work with in producing these webinars, without whom none of this would happen. Dr. Hernan Garcia with NOAA NESDIS National Centers for Environmental Information, Sandra Klar with the NOAA NESDIS Office of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, and Katie Rowley with the NOAA Central Library. We usually have NOAA staffers assist us with these NOAA leadership webinars, and today we have Megan Balling, Coastal Aquaculture Program Analyst, working for CSS in support of NOAA Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Megan will be moderating the questions and answers. Thanks, Megan. Here are a few webinar, log webinar logistics, and most of them are also online in the chat box. If your system is lagging or breaking up, try closing all apps to free up the bandwidth space. We are recording this seminar for later viewing, and the link to access the recording will be posted in the chat too. All attendees are muted. Type your questions and comments into the chat box at any time, and we will address as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So today's NOAA Leadership Seminar is titled, New Spatial and Engineering Intelligence Applications for Pioneering Ocean Food Systems and Energy Production. And our speaker is Dr. James Morris, Jr., a marine ecologist with NOAA's National Ocean Service, National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. His research focuses on aquaculture and environmental interactions, siting, and sustainability. Dr. Morris founded the Coastal Aquaculture Siting and Sustainability, or CAS, research program, which consists of multidisciplinary scientists who develop tools and provide services for coastal managers. His team is presently leading research projects around the U.S. on spatial planning for nearshore and offshore aquaculture and assessments of environmental interactions, such as impacts on protected species and sensitive habitats. Dr. Morris has cultured dozens of species of marine fish and shellfish for both laboratory experiments and seafood production, and has decades of experience in commercial fishing and aquaculture industries. Dr. Morris is an adjunct assistant professor at both Duke University and North Carolina State University, where he actively teaches and advises students from undergrad to PhD levels. And last, Dr. Morris received a Presidential Career Award from President Obama. So welcome, Dr. Morris, and thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tracy. I just want to do a sound check, make sure you can hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for uh, spending your afternoon thinking a little bit about um, pine pioneering offshore um, industries. I'd like to thank um, the, the, seri the seminar series leadership, Ernan, Tracy, and others for um, this invitation. It's really an honor to be able to um, spend the afternoon with you and talk with you about some of the uh, things that we have going on. Um, I work in the Ocean Services National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. I've been working in NCOS now for over 20 years, and uh, I truly love our, our NOAA missions. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about our NOAA mission. I really enjoy the work that um, we do as an agency and the, uh, and the great impact that we are having um, in terms of ensuring a sustainable um, ocean future, and um, I want to share a little bit about a little bit of thoughts with you about that today. Um, first, I'd like to start with a quote that I picked up yesterday. Um, in fact, it was published in the Island Institute and a um, a nonprofit organization in Maine that I that I have been following for a couple of decades. And um, this quote came from a uh, a shellfish farmer and seaweed farmer in Maine named Bree Warner. I just want to share it with you because um, it, it really uh, conjured up the feelings that I hope to, um, to, to leave with you today about hope. Um, it says aquaculture is hope and that's what I look up the coast and see. It's just um, an entire coast full of hope. And I want to talk with you a little bit today about pioneers, about ocean pioneers and how um, there's one thing that every pioneer has to have is hope, or they wouldn't be a pioneer. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the hopes and dreams of what our sort of some of our ocean futures look like. Um, support for the work that I'm going to be sharing today comes from our um, our home office in NCOS, as well as the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, and then a large part of the support has come from the Department of Energy. Um, this um, uh, work was funded as part of the Mariner RPE program. 
Uh, a lot of it has been, and we're going to talk with you a bit about the spatial planning infrastructure that was um, built um, uh, with support from the Department of Energy. I'd like to um, also share just our, our team uh, here in NCOS that is working around the nation to be able to uh, bring aquaculture and spatial science technology to the forefront. Uh, we have a team comprised of engineers, spatial scientists, uh, modelers, policy folks, um, uh, engineers, and marine ecologists and biologists. Uh, truly a multidisciplinary team. And uh, none of the work that I'm going to be sharing with you today is, is, uh, uh, was done uh, by one person. It's definitely a, a teamwork. And, um, and I want to make sure that I recognize them and their great work and contributions to this. And we have a few other team member slides that we're going to share as well as we go. Our work in, in the Ocean Service on aquaculture is really uh, about empowering coastal managers. We work to uh, develop a blended research and services portfolio that we love that interplay between, between um, research and services, the services that we provide informs directly the science that we do. And the science that we do helps us provide better services to coastal managers. We work to provide support and by way of planning, tools, siting, and environmental sciences to all of the federal and state agencies that are involved in coastal management of aquaculture. And then we have other, some other projects dealing with some other coastal industries and um, pioneering ocean industries as well, largely in the renewable energy space. And we're gonna talk more about that uh, later. To date, we've performed around 50 spatial analyses around the coastlines of the U.S. Um, in the last five years. This has brought to us a tremendous amount of insight into the um, application of spatial data and spatial planning in both estuaries as well as coastal ocean environments. We're finding now that states are, are, are pulling our services in terms of supporting state-level planning efforts, such as designated aquaculture use areas and estuaries, um, working to working with ports and harbors to uh, realize um, and quantify the opportunity for aquaculture development um, along the uh, within the resources that are managed by ports and harbors. Remembering that ports are some are are some of our nation's largest coastal businesses, and that they manage significant amount of natural resources. Aquaculture is a is a, a potential opportunity for many of our ports around the nation. <clears throat> I want to jump out for just a second and talk about um, how how we see food and energy um, as being uh, significantly more higher priority than any other coastal uses um, that we manage to date. Um, any every society around the around the world is uh, is organically connected to where food comes from and where energy comes from. Uh, without food and energy, uh, that, uh, sorry, I got closed caption popping up. Um, food and energy are, without a doubt, the most um, most important two um, issues facing facing most communities and especially coastal communities. Interestingly, we are seeing significant advancement in both food ocean food systems and uh, energy production systems in the offshore environment. We have been for a few for a couple of decades and certainly the current administration is very serious about development of renewable energy. And we have seen aquaculture uh, migrating into offshore environments now. But we also see um, uh, technology emerging such as uh, wave energy technology. We see multiple prototypes and uses of, of wind turbine technology and of course aquaculture, both shellfish, finfish and seaweed aquaculture. However, um, we are seeing now the emergence of some giants, some pioneering ocean giants into the ocean space. And these uh, giants are, um, are in the case of wind turbines, uh, wind turbines now can, can, can be as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Um, General Electric recently released the Haliod X 12 megawatt wind turbine. Um, as you can see from the graphic, you know, this is a, this, this tower is up around almost 900 feet tall. Um, no longer are we thinking about small ocean development initiatives, we're thinking large 
giant level ocean development initiatives. Similarly with aquaculture, we're seeing countries like Norway and China are investing significant uh, resources into, uh, into large uh, scale um, aquaculture net pen technologies that are delivered on, on ships like, like large oil platforms or, um, um, and are deployed and are capable of producing you know, $100 million worth of, um, of fish in the course of one crop. We're also seeing significant um, development initiatives such as ship-based aquaculture in which, um, uh, in which finfish are cultured in, um, in uh, renovated or restored oil tankers. We see various prototypes such as theirs on the, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen that, that um, works towards closed containment technology in the ocean. So the pioneering front is highly innovative. It always has been, it always will be. And we're seeing significant innovation happening in terms of bringing ocean food production systems as well as energy production systems into the ocean space. Lastly, I'd like to share with you that um, I had the, a great opportunity to give a, um, to give the, a lecture at the U.S. Naval Academy a few months ago. And it, we really talked about how food security is national security. And we don't need to really talk even about how energy security is national security. That's very obvious. But something that doesn't get as much um, play today is, is the importance of food security as, uh, as national security and the reliance that we have as a country on imported seafood and the availability of that seafood in the future. Um, all, all the signs point to the U.S. Um, uh, uh, how it is necessary that we continue to become more secure when it comes to where we especially source our seafood and uh, particularly marine protein. And so um, towards, uh, along these efforts, there are several initiatives underway to work towards um, providing a more secure, food secure uh, um, environment for us. I mentioned briefly earlier that the Department of Energy has been a major partner with us in this work. Um, thanks much to uh, um, an interagency agreement a few years ago with the Department of Energy. We have been able to pool resources and leverage on building some of the most marine, uh, uh, data intensive marine spatial planning infrastructure um, that we have ever had. Uh, we have built novel applications and been able to work towards planning areas in the coastal ocean. Um, all ocean pioneers will benefit from this uh, infrastructure that was built along with the Department of Energy. I'd like to share with you that today we are sitting on an unprecedented amount of marine spatial data that we have been compiling for the last um, five years or so to be able to build the capacity to do regional marine spatial planning. Um, we are now capable of building suitability models that are that are able to that we are able to interact with and and identify the best locations for different types of uh, ocean uses. Um, this is unprecedented in that um, we have been able to to uh, to work with our uh, federal and state partners in in the regions to be able to compile um, our aquaspatial uh, data catalog. That, it, that has millions, literally millions of data layers uh, within the catalog and allows us to do um, dynamic um, marine spatial planning to inform the permitting process while it is underway, as well as do proactive planning work. Um, I'd like to share with you one of those applications that we have built um, along with our colleagues at, with the Office for Coastal Management and, and BOEM. The Ocean Reports Project has unquestionably been a fascinating uh, project for us. We have, um, we said the vision for this was that we could, um, is that a person would be able to pull up the application and be able to go anywhere on a map and draw a box in uh, any U.S. ocean space and receive a customized spatial analysis for, uh, for that ocean neighborhood. And we were able to pull that off with collaboration with a blended workforce um, of contractors and, and federal scientists across the Bureau of Oceans Energy Management and NCOS and the Office for Coastal Management. Um, today, this application is live. I'll ask that you not go search it because if you do, you're going to miss the rest of the talk. Um, this application is really captivating. Um, you can go anywhere on the map and draw a box and receive 
um, as customized spatial analysis for that ocean space. We have truly segued marine spatial data archiving and a repository and the repository capabilities of marine cadaster. We've transitioned that into an interactive application in which uh, provides automated marine spatial planning analyses for any type of ocean uh, questions that you might have. So within one second now, the application runs, um, produces about 81 infographics, over 100 queries, uh, it searches around 160 vector and raster layers, and, all, and does all that in a, in, in a, in a quick uh, return uh, from the, um, uh, of, of search in that ocean neighborhood. I'll give you an example of some of the things that you can find out. So let's say that you are a, a coastal manager or industry that is looking to um, investigate uh, either a conservation issue or perhaps you're interested in developing something along uh, the coastline of the U.S. or in the open ocean. Um, there, there, you may have a meeting coming up, a pre-application meeting in which you need to prepare for that meeting. Or you may just be speculating in terms of where um, shore-based um, shore infrastructure will need to be built in the future and those kind of things. The purpose of Ocean Reports is to be able to inform those early planning conversations, be able to um, attend those meetings and interact with the coastal com management community and, and, and business community with the most informed um, information about the, that ocean neighborhood. So for example, when you draw a box in the ocean, you get this report. It provides information about the report area that you have just drawn, the depth and elevation, the populated places. Um, all of these are, are provided in terms of infographics. You also, it also shares with you the congressional and legislative districts, the federal statutes that govern that ocean space. In addition, information is provided about the oceanography and biophysical environment. Here we have um, both physical data that are analyzed as well as wet chemistry information such as um, uh, chlorophyll, harmful algal blooms, aragonite, silicates, phosphates, nitrates, in addition to med-ocean data such as wave height, period and direction, wave speed and direction, currents, and those kind of things. Next we have um, energy and minerals profiles for those ocean spaces are provided. We provide information on the wind potential, um, the number of homes that could be, for example, um, powered if wind energy were developed in that ocean space. We provide information on existing uses, such as wind energy leases or oil and gas planning areas, leases, um, and those kind of things. We also provide information on natural resources and conservation, we provide information on endangered species, information on highly migratory species, artificial reefs, shallow corals, deep sea corals and protected areas. And then we also provide um, information about the industries that work in that ocean space. The vessels, um, the AIS data, the vessel traffic that is happening in that ocean space, the, um, the areas around ports such as port, um, such as pilot boarding areas. Uh, we have military data. Um, that can be shared with the public, and such as unexploded ordnance areas, wrecks and obstructions, cables and pipelines, aquaculture facilities, as well as many different other types of ocean industry uses. And then lastly, an economic analysis is performed with ocean space. Building on the ENOW model, um, we provide information about ocean job contributions, GDP of the ocean economy, census statistics, etc. So all that information is available now um, at the click of a mouse um, in your recliner uh, with your fuzzy slippers on. You can now become an ocean explorer yourself. We are really excited about how this work is transforming um, the understanding of the ocean and specifically ocean neighborhoods. Uh, we're excited that we, are, that we are able to influence ocean literacy, the value that Americans have for the for the coastal ocean by being able to be an explorer. We're working with, for example, with our Office of, um, of Education to be able to consider uh, modules to go into high school, middle school, college, room, college uh, courses to be able to help bring this technology, bring this application into our education system. We also have, uh, we were directed by the White House Office of Science, Technology and Policy to hold a stakeholder evaluation 
um, uh, exercise, which we did over the last six months. We gave dozens of webinars on this over the last year. We held specific stakeholder uh, valuation assessments, and we're able to identify many different types of improvements to bring uh, this, uh, this application really into the coastal management community and even bring it in as a NEPA scoping tool, um, given the value that it has in terms of, of compiling presenting and analyzing big ocean data uh, and making it presentable um, to inform all coastal and ocean conversations that are happening about very, our various ocean neighborhoods. I'd like to switch gears for a second and share some of the work that's happening along the planning areas front for aquaculture. Many of you are familiar with planning areas for oil and gas or for um, mining and other types of things that happen in the coastal ocean. Building upon now almost four decades um, of science on aquaculture in our agency, um, over the last few years, um, it has become obvious that we, were, we had arrived at the point where there existed enough expertise and enough um, spatial planning capabilities, especially given the infrastructure that was built um, in collaboration with our with the Department of Energy, that we could embark um, in an effort to develop aquaculture planning areas or aquaculture opportunity areas in coastal regions of the U.S. There was support from industry, there was support from coastal management community, there was support from our leadership um, that, um, that, that all supported development of this initiative. So an executive order was signed in, in May 7th of 2020 calling for um, assessment of and development of aquaculture opportunity areas. Now, I want to be very clear that this effort is not an effort to pre-permit aquaculture. This is a planning exercise built to ensure that aquaculture development in, coast, in the coastal ocean environments around in our nation are, are at the highest level of, um, of, in, of our environmental ethic. That we also are working towards um, the most sustainable um, ocean use compatibility assessments. Um, this, this executive order calls for development of 10 areas within seven years. The areas can be in both state or federal waters. The areas can include um, culture of algae, shellfish, and finfish. This is largely a planning exercise. It doesn't change the permitting process. It builds the infrastructure. It builds the capacity um, for uh, better, more uh, efficient permitting to be able and to ensure that um, ahead of time that that planning has been in place. So to date, we have worked to, um, to, to build the planning infrastructure for uh, these aquaculture opportunity areas. Um, we, have, uh, we have worked to build suitability models um, to be able to do the spatial planning for these opportunity areas. Now, if you're familiar with suitability models, suitability models are very, are very important for assessing spatially um, where a certain planning goal um, has the highest level of suitability or compatibility. We essentially are able to use big, big ocean data resources to be able to map, create a heat map of where the best um, opportunities would be for a particular planning goal, such as aquaculture. Here you can see on the left, we have a table with some examples of data that might go into a suitability model. That data is scored based on its compatibility with the planning goal, in this case, aquaculture. We're then able to uh, create a model that provides a score for each of the grid cells that you see within that planning area. This, this here is a heat map. As you can see, the blowout, if you, if you uh, enlarge the, the heat map, you'll see that we have grid cells. We have hexagon grid cells that overlay that study area. And we, are, and we use a suitability model to calculate the suitability score for each one of those grid cells. And then we compare the suitability score across the entire study area. That is how we're able to create a heat map. And so what you see here, there are areas such as pipelines and cable areas that would show up in a, in a heat map that are incompatible for aquaculture development, shipping lanes, for example, as well. Then we have other types of, of areas that such as the green or the yellow areas that have the higher compatibility scores. And those are areas in which further investigation could lead to looking at suitability for aquaculture. This is, why, this is the process that we use to develop um, 
heat maps, uh, suitability maps for aquaculture opportunity areas for the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. Uh, we have we built a suitability model, which was essentially a four sub-model suitability model encompassing national security, industry and navigation, natural and cultural resources, and fishing and aquaculture. We're then able to calculate those scores and use cluster analysis to be able to identify the precise, precise locations of options for aquaculture opportunity areas. And those options are now going, will go forward into a programmatic environmental impact statement for evaluation. And ultimately, one of those may be selected as the aquaculture opportunity area within those regions. To build the data resources for these suitability modeling or heat map um, modeling process, we literally met with thousands of stakeholders in the regions. We held almost 400 direct meetings with uh, stakeholders across various types of you know, military, national res natural uh, resources, uh, industries, navigation, governance and boundaries. And we, uh, we mined for data within those regions and we worked with them to those stakeholders to interpret the data um, at, in order to build the suitability model. So this gives you a sense of the study areas that we are analyzing. Essentially, we have built um, suitability models for each one of these study areas. There were uh, four study areas in the Gulf of Mexico and four study areas in Southern California Bight. Those study areas were developed in consultation with industry in terms of the types of depths and ocean environments that industry could operate. And we are now in the process of um, publishing the, uh, the atlases that will take into account all the different data layers that go into uh, those suitability models. Interestingly, we, were, we identified approximately 200 data layers, 204 in the Southern California Bight and 220 in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was interesting that how close those two regions are together in terms of the amount of data. And that may in fact represent somewhat of a, of a saturation curve on the availability of data and the amount of data layers that are required for a regional marine spatial planning process such as this. And if you look at the breakdown of the different types of layers, you can see that you know, there was tremendous numbers of uh, fishing and aquaculture layers for Southern California, uh, 50 of those and 14 for the Gulf of Mexico. Whereas in terms of industry use, there were 60 data layers for, for the Gulf of Mexico and 42 for um, Southern California. So it's quite interesting to look at the differences in the ocean neighborhoods and the types of data that were available. But interestingly, both regions came in around 200 data layers. So our last steps now for this spatial analysis is to produce atlases. We're really excited to be able to roll out the atlases in early November. Um, these are truly atlases. They are books of maps that provide the most in-depth um, marine spatial planning and data analysis has ever been uh, done in U.S. waters um, at a regional scale. Um, we will, these, these atlases will uh, directly inform the programmatic environmental impact statements for AOAs, uh, for the AOA options within the regions, and ultimately will be valuable for other ocean industries and other, other ocean uses as well. Who, uh, that folks will be, the public and coastal managers will be able to reference the atlases for better understanding the ocean regions um, within the Southern California Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. I'd like to transition for a moment to um, conclude with the, the last um, bit of sort of, of intelligent applications that we are working on. This relates to the interactions between these pioneering ocean industries and uh, protected species. Uh, we have for some time been evaluating specifically uh, aquaculture interactions with protected species. Uh, we have published um, numerous workshop reports and publications and peer review um, publications on the topic. We have assessed the global literature. We've studied um, international um, uh, records when it comes to protected species interactions with aquaculture as um, other countries have more developed aquaculture industries than we do. And so there's much to be learned um, in other countries in terms of uh, how those industries affect and interact with, with, uh, with protected species. We were very excited uh, when we identified the opportunity to apply essentially virtual reality 
uh, applications in the in under, better understanding protected species interactions. Now, some of you may have kids at home, or you yourself um, play video games such as Fortnite or NBA 2K or some of these video games that have quite realistic um, graphics. Those graphics are created largely from uh, from uh, are, are fantasy based. Um, the figures and the graphics and the way that the um, the uh, the game is able to to display interactions between the the figure in the game and its environment are largely fantasy based. We have set out set about to develop a physics based um, virtual reality simulator for protected species to be able to better understand interactions with pioneering ocean industries such as renewable energy and aquaculture. Now this application, while it's fairly new in terms of protected species or even in ecology, and um, it's not new when it comes to developing simulations for automobiles or flight simulators or some of the other types of more conventional simulation technology. Those are, for the most part, math-based, physics-based type simulation approaches. We are very excited that of late, of the last five years or so, the rapid evolution in, in higher um, graphics um, uh, engines and physics-based engines to be able that, that underpin these uh, virtual game technologies has enabled us to do things that we couldn't have done before in terms of being able to assess protected species and aquaculture gear interactions and by extension potentially other interactions. We have assembled a team of scientists um, from around the U.S. that specialize in, uh, in simulation technology as well as in engineering and, um, and protected species uh, uh, interactions, largely large whale and sea turtle um, behavior and morphology uh, and those kind of things. And we have a design team that with a very multidisciplinary uh, background. Um, we are working right now with support from the Bureau of Oceans Energy Management to develop two simulators, one for floating wind turbines and one for aquaculture. Right now we have um, uh, simulations that are being developed for humpback whale, for the North Atlantic right whale, for blue and fin whales, and also for leatherback uh, sea turtles. To give you a, 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 a sense of how we're building the simulator, um, we have essentially uh, are incorporating physical models um, provide, that provides validation of forces and deflections in the gear, whether it be aquaculture gear or, or mooring lines or cables from, uh, from floating wind farms. Uh, we're able to couple that with a, a computational fluid dynamics model. Ultimately, we're going to be building a finite element model here that's capable of computing forces and movements and coefficients for the whale at various um, uh, relative environments here of uh, water currents, etc. We can also calculate forces on the aquaculture components such as the lines and floats and, and those kind of things. All of that goes into a simulator in which we have used the ability to um, use an external physics calculator that gives us calculations on, on buoyancy and interaction forces um, with each time step. And then we're able to build on the, uh, the Unity cross-platform gaming engine where we have our internal physics engine, collision detection, motion, forces, and those kind of things. Ultimately, the, uh, the animal in this case can be controlled either by the computer or by a gaming controller. Uh, we're able to, to run simulations that um, can, can be on the order of 10,000, 50,000 different scenarios of interactions between the animal and the gear. And from that, we ultimately are going to learn a number of things. To be able to, uh, to populate the simulator, we have relied on uh, data that we have collected from tank tests and water tunnels at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, they are a very important partner with this work. We have done uh, force load testing and, all, and deflection testing and such using models of, uh, of whales within the uh, tank tests. Uh, some of this work goes back more than 10 years of data collection in a laboratory in terms of the, the, um, the, the physics behind um, animal movements and interactions. We also have direct calculations of drag coefficients um, and those kind of things, ultimately to build, the, um, to, to build the physics behind the simulator. To be able to look at how the animal interacts with the gear and in the environment, 
we have to we have to build collision models and for example the one on the left here this the colors represent the different collision bodies and in ways that a computer can look at the interactions with different compartments of the well and ultimately all of that gets um, combined together to give us a uh, the whole animal um, movement and interaction uh, various scenarios similar here you can see how we build that wireframe or mesh you know for the animal um, taking from it you know uh, from uh, videos and pictures and other ways that we can validate proportions and movement capabilities and working with various experts around the nation and the world to be able to bring in the best available science you know, on these uh, animals and their movement capabilities. Ultimately, we will have um, later this fall a, a whale entanglement simulator that we can look at whale interactions with uh, muscle longline aquaculture and then later next year for floating wind farms. This is really exciting because we're going to be able to uh, provide this as a tool that can help inform risk assessment. Uh, we understand that this particular approach is not going to answer all the questions. There will be limitations and assumptions that follow this simulator uh, that should be incorporated when taken into the data. But ultimately the goal is that we can use this analytical approach to provide information on the mechanics and the physics behind entanglement. That information can then go back to engineering and we can work to re-engineer these, um, these pioneering ocean industries, gears and technology to be able to reduce potentially the risk of entanglement um, and, and, and near entanglement events uh, in the future. And so today we're pretty excited. Uh, last week we were able to look at our first um, video from the simulator. This is very much a prototype of, um, of what's to come. Um, the graphics will improve. We just wanted to be able to show you what we're talking about here. Now, what I'm going to, before I hit play, um, what I want to I orient everyone, here we have um, an underwater view of a muscle uh, long line system. These are dropper lines that would be um, typically uh, used to culture mussels. These are not, these dropper lines are not tethered at the bottom. They are essentially free suspending vertically in the water column. And so we, um, I'm going to hit play now. And what you're going to see happen here is the whales coming in from the right hand side of the screen. And I want you just to think for a moment about how much math is behind the scenes and how much computer programming is behind the scenes. Every movement Every interaction that you're seeing here with the muscle long lines has math behind it, has physics behind it. Um, this particular scenario, the whale is swimming directly through the muscle long line droppers. Um, there is, there is no, um, no turning or twisting or anything like that. If you, as you can imagine, the computer or a user, a user simulator, can create almost an infinite number, perhaps an infinite number of interactions or scenarios. We could ask the computer or the simulator to run those scenarios until, for example, you know, it maxes out on the computing power or the time limits of the simulator um, or the physical maneuverable capabilities of the animal. Ultimately, we'll then receive statistics that we'll be able to analyze in terms of the number of scenarios that resulted in an entanglement or the number of scenarios that resulted in near misses and, and, and those kind of things. Ultimately, we will be able to uh, take that information and be able to consult with experts and, and verify and validate whether or not some of those scenarios that potentially result in entanglement uh, uh, are real or not. And, and, ask, and, and work through some of those questions and provide a tremendous amount of intelligence into the consultation process um, resulting from this and into re-engineering some of these systems to uh, towards higher conservation. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So ultimately we will have a, a graphic user interface in which we can um, can modify the different types of scenarios. We can uh, adjust the gear that's in the simulator in terms of rope tension and anchoring systems and rope diameter and those kind of things to be able to ask the simulator questions. You know, how, how large does a rope have to be before it potentially in, uh, creates an entanglement scenario and those kind of things. But, we're, but the graphic user interface in terms of input 
and the graphical user interface in terms of output and statistics are two things that we're currently working on right now. So lastly, uh, this simulator is a big, big team effort. Um, as I mentioned, we have a design team. We have an advisory team made up of experts from around the, the U.S. We have a workshop planned for later this winter. That will be an international workshop, pulling in experts to be able to provide advice and, and consultation to us on this, on this uh, simulator concept. And we're really excited about the amount of involvement that we have in this project from our, our colleagues um, within the um, within PRD and, and OPR and around and regional offices around the nation. So with that I have a few takeaway messages um, that would tie in hopefully all of these um, these applications of big spatial data, marine spatial ecology, marine spatial planning, um, protected species, um, ocean reports, uh, entanglement sim simulators and a couple of things I want to share with you. One, where are we going to develop pioneering ocean industries? Where are we going to sustain fishing? Where exactly are we going to increase conservation? These are the, mis these are the missions, these are the directions that we have re are receiving from our leaders. Where are we going to do those things? To answer the where question requires regional and national level marine spatial planning. We're excited that we've been able to do that for aquaculture in two regions. We're excited that that work will likely continue in other regions. We're excited that, that, that we've built um, and are on our way to, to continuing to build the um, marine spatial planning infrastructure that can enable answering that where question. Um, but we have a lot more work to do. NOAA has a pivotal role in, re in regional marine spatial planning. Who else could do it? No other agency, no other federal agency has the marine spatial planning experience, the marine spatial data resources that we have within NOAA. The Bureau of Oceans and Energy Management uh, provides significant support to NOAA to support building our marine spatial infrastructure. Other federal agencies rely on our services to be able to, to understand uh, ocean neighborhoods and what all is happening there. Um, we need to continue to, to grow and mature in our ability to do regional marine spatial planning. I'm a very, I have so much passion for our NOAA Trust resources, fishing, habitat, protected species. But we have to provide intelligence before we are required to respond to protect those resources. And we do that through good planning, good intelligence gathering, proactive analysis of ocean neighborhoods, how, how they have been in the past, how they are today, and, and the environments that they will be in the future. Our NOAA Trust resources demand active engagement in regional planning. I'm very excited for the experiences that we've had of late with fishing communities. Um, tell a story for a second. Bob Dooley, a member of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, um, a leader in uh, Seafood Harvesters of America, knocked on my door, came to our community, come to our laboratory, talk to us directly about how we're incorporating fishing data into marine spatial planning for aquaculture. We're seeing fishing communities around the nation becoming more involved, um, and this is a difficult path. Fishing communities generally do not like sharing where they like to fish. That's very obviously, it's inherently part of who they are. Um, we're seeing great progress in that, in, in fishing communities and fishing community leaders coming forward, wanting to get more involved in broader and regional marine spatial planning efforts. Um, it's the wave of the future, and we love seeing it, and we've got to do a better job in it in terms of participatory mapping and other types of approaches. Next directions. This, this now this infrastructure that has been built in terms of data resources, intelligent applications, etc., provide us with the power to do scenario planning. We have the ability to couple scenario planning and trade-off analyses and incorporate issues such as climate change to better understand how our ocean environments um, can be both exploited and conserved and many times at, uh, at the same time. It all requires continued uh, um, uh, analysis and marine spatial planning. Remember our ocean neighborhoods are constantly changing. The environments are changing. The uses are changing. It is a dynamic, it's a dynamic marine spatial planning process.
And then lastly, we are all focused on resiliency and increasing resiliency in the, in the, in the face of pandemics, in the face of um, hurricanes and other types of natural disasters. And I like to end with the message that well-planned communities are, res are resilient communities. Um, thank you today. I, I hope that this has been um, insightful for you. I look forward to interacting with you during the question and answer session. And, um, and um, my email is available if any of you would like to interact if we're not able to um, answer any of your questions today. So now we'll turn it back over to Tracy and Megan. Hey everybody. Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm Megan Balling. I work with James Morris and the CAST team in an administrative and communications capacity. And I'm going to try and get to everyone's comments. I think I've answered a few already, but James is going to have a much better answer for this one. James, for the simulator, Ellen asks, what information is being used to assess the animal's response and behavior when it encounters the gear? And how do you determine which behaviors are most likely and should be modeled? Sure, that's a great question from Ellen. Um, you know, our animal behavior team is is working on that working on that question. We're very focused right now on getting the simulator to be able to model those behavior. You know, model a a large number of behaviors. Review of those potential behaviors and responses is something that will happen much more down the road once we have a functional simulator. So I would say hold your Hold your uh, question, and um, hopefully, you know, down the road during workshops and during as we interact with the, the national and global protected species community, we will be able to collect more and more of that feedback in terms of um, behavior and, and responses. But right now, our focus is on physics and maneuverability scenarios when it comes to the um, protected species. Okay, thanks so much, James. Uh, Granada asks, what kind of data do you wish you had to work with now that you don't have or don't have easy access to either satellite or in situ? Mm. Um, hey, Renata, the, you know, we, you're never done. With, with marine spatial planning analyses, you run out of time and you run out, you run out of resources. You don't run out of data to analyze or ideas on, on how to do that analysis. And, um, what we shoot for is obviously doing a, a really good job of running the analysis, but there's always assumptions and always more data that could be gotten. We're really excited about satellite data. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to use um, um, AI, you know, artificial intelligence analysis of satellite data, be able to look at um, data from, you know, whale interactions around aquaculture or wind farms, being able to mine data for vessel traffic information. Uh, we know that AIS data is, is, doesn't capture all vessel traffic. Uh, we know that some of our fishing data doesn't capture all fishing. So there's, there are ways to use AI and other approaches to be able to analyze satellite data. That's a growth area for us that we're, that we're working in and, and, work, and want to continue to go down that road. Um, when it comes to the, you know, the, the primary interactions that are happening in coastal ocean environments, you know, are vessel traffic, fishing interactions, protected species interactions, and existing seafloor infrastructure. And so we can use satellite data and other types of shore-based radar data, those kind of things, to get a better sense of activity. Um, and that, that information can greatly influence results of the, of the suitability models. So, Anyway, I would put it into the satellite data. Okay, thank you, James. Britta asks, this is a long one, wait for it. Given the discrepancy between available environmental data and that of national security and industry data, meaning there is way more available data for industry and security than, environment, than environmental data, do you think planning for aquaculture can be sufficiently done at this time? Won't preference or deference be given to national security and industry uses on the water if that is the case? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, 
So remember that we're doing planning, and so uh, if anyone wants to actually develop in those ocean spaces, they have to go through the permitting process, which will bring in additional resources, additional analysis of that that's unique to that specific project goal. Um, we did this work for AOAs at a very high level. Uh, we have screened out the major interactions. Um, we're very fortunate to work with our DOD colleagues to be able to incorporate um, data that's not publicly available, um, be able to work through the security, talking about uh, confidential data and, and classified data. Um, they were very cooperative with us and provided data in such, a way, such ways that we could use it for this planning analysis. Um, we're able to develop a mission compatibility analysis with the Department of Defense, specifically for aquaculture in both regions. A very, a very challenging process you know, for both agencies. But we got on board and we worked it out and, uh, and, and we, have some, we have some great input from DOD about future, about their current uses of the ocean and future uses of the ocean. I agree with you that um, we're never satisfied with the amount of environmental data uh, we would love to, you know, we, we have, for example, already informed, you know, habitat mapping prioritization process, process that we worked um, collaboratively on um, within our agency and with, with BOEM as well. And there's, uh, there's all, we hope in the future to have a seat at the table for those prioritization processes for collecting environmental data to, to help inform uh, sustainable aquaculture development. Okay, thank you, James. I don't think I see any additional questions that were not answered, um, but I would highlight that I put a few links into the chat box here. The first one is the Coastal Aquaculture Siting and Sustainability website. If you guys want a little bit more in-depth information on our coastal planning and siting, environmental interactions work, and the ecosystem services offered by Coastal Aquaculture, you can click that first one. Um, if you guys scroll up in the chat, there were a few questions about where we're working. Are we in Alaska? Are we in Hawaii? Um, you'll see that the Ocean Reports tool is everything in the U.S. EEZ. So you'll see information for Alaska, for highly migratory species in there as well, um, other protected resources. So give that, give that a click. Um, and then finally, the Coastal Aquaculture Planning Portal. This has tons of tools, um, and it's intended to be a toolbox to assist managers and coastal planners with aquaculture and other activities. So if there are no other questions, Tracy, did you wanna take us home? Sure. So James, I wanna thank you for a terrific seminar, and I'm sorry for the delay at the beginning, but we can cut that out of the recording. And I wanna thank everybody who joined us today, including Megan Balling, who is a terrific question moderator. And I wanna thank Fabio and uh, all in the captioner and everybody who helped make this possible today. James, any last words? No, not, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. If you have ideas or if this has stimulated a opportunity for collaboration, please don't hesitate to reach out. We, we, love, uh, we love our missions here and we love collaborating with, our, with the NOAA community. Thank you so much, Tracy, again, for the invitation. Okay, thanks everybody, bye-bye.